it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wendy Hewitt. Um, she is coming to us from the University of Colorado in Denver. She's a professor of medicine in the Division of Geriatric Medicine. She's also a director of research for the Geriatric Medicine and director of the Energy Balance Core Laboratory and the Nutrition and Obesity Research Center. Okay, her focus is on age-related changes in metabolism, sex steroids, and body composition, with an emphasis on understanding uh, the changes that are triggered, triggered by menopause. Her interventions include exercise, weight loss, and hormone therapy, and they're directed at learning more about the mechanisms for menopausal changes in body composition and fat distribution. <laughs> Other research includes the influence of musculoskeletal health and physical function in aging. Okay, her current projects are on how the destruction of calcium homeostasis through exercise <coughs> influences bone metabolism and whether non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs block the expected musculoskeletal benefits of exercise. <coughs> Dr. Cord has been continuously funded by the NIH as a principal investigator for 21 years, and she has more than 140 original and invited research articles. She currently is a PI on two NIH R01 grants, which is the very top level of funding that you can receive from the National Institutes of Health. And she is a co-investigator on six other NIH awards. She serves on the advisory, uh, Federal Advisory Committee that prepares evidence reports for first physical activity guidelines for Americans, um, which was launched by the Department of Health and Human Services in 2008. She is a co-chair of the steering committee of the National Research Council, um, looking at the effects of biological and physical science in space. And she has been recognized as the distinguished alumni of the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. She has received citation awards from the American College of Sports Medicine and the Herbert A. DeVries Research Award for the American Association for Physical Activity and Recreation. So today she will be talking to us about the novel regulators of skeletal response to exercise. So please let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Rhonda, and thanks very much, Barry, for finally um, making it possible for me to come down here and join the very distinguished ranks of speakers that you've had uh, present this lecture. I don't know if you appreciate just how lucky you are to have somebody who works so hard to bring some of the best people from the American College of Sports Medicine and other exercise science groups down here to share their research with you. And it's indeed a privilege for me to do so today. I want to talk to you about novel regulators of the skeletal response to exercise. But before you can determine what's novel, you have to know what is known. So I'm going to start out today by going over what our current recommendations are for physical activity and bone health. So that's at a public health level. The evidence base that is large enough that we can actually come up with some specific recommendations and guidelines about how to keep bones healthy and prevent fractures in old age. Then I'm going to go over some of the established factors that influence the skeletal responses to exercise. And then finally, I'll uh, get into the more exciting work on the novel regulators. So as Rhonda mentioned, uh, I was on the Federal Advisory Committee that prepared the evidence report from which the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines were developed. The evidence report, which is available uh, through the CDC website, if you want to look at that, it's a multi-hundred page document. But once we compiled all of the evidence on physical activity and health outcomes, we determined that for skeletal health specifically, we have only a moderate level of evidence that physical activity either lowers the risk of hip fracture or improves bone mineral density, which is the best predictor of risk fracture or a hip fracture that we have. So that's kind of discouraging that we don't have a larger body of evidence. But I think you can see that our evidence base is growing. So this is, the, this is the compilation of data to demonstrate that we have at least some encouraging evidence 
that people who are physically active are less likely to break their hips than people who are sedentary. So let me orient you to this slide. Um, if uh, well, what we're comparing here are prospective cohort studies and case control studies, so large population-based studies, where they categorized the individuals by different level of physical activity. And these are the studies that had at, three, at least three different categories of physical activity. And we're looking at the relative risk of hip fracture in the most active group compared to the least active group. So if the rates of hip fracture were the same in those two groups, if physical activity didn't have any effect, we would expect all of the point estimates to line up on one. But the fact that all the point estimates are to the left of one or less than one means that the most active group was less likely to break a hip than the least active group. And if you look at where these points fall, I'm not sure if you can see the scale down here or not, but it's a risk reduction in the neighborhood of about 50%. So the most physically active people are about 50% less likely to break their hip than the most sedentary group. And the reason we didn't say we had stronger evidence to support this is because we look at these horizontal lines, the confidence intervals, to generate just how confident we are in making this uh, uh, interpretation of the data. So if those confidence lines do not cross one, we have at least 95% confidence that this isn't something that we just observe by chance. So the fact that a few of these studies had confidence intervals that go beyond one means that our level, of, our level of confidence is not as high as we would like it to be. So that's why we put a moderate level of strength on these relationships. What we really want to know, though, is how much physical activity did the people have to do to get this magnitude of benefit? And for many of the studies, we weren't able to determine that because they basically used qualifications rather than quantifications to describe activity. They might have said people were just low level, moderate level, high level. That doesn't help us out. But there were actually four studies that used a quantitative approach. And they each used different means of quantifying physical activity. So it was in met hours per week, kilocalories of physical activity per week, hours of walking, or just hours of physical activity. And for these, at least the first three um, are pretty consistent in that these three studies suggest that three to four hours of physical activity per week, or in one case specifically walking per week, was the minimal level of physical activity needed to generate a significant reduction in risk for hip fracture. So I think, does anybody know what the current physical activity recommendation is? How many minutes a week? 150. So is our current recommendation for physical activity for Americans sufficient to reduce hip fracture risk? Probably not. But we didn't want to put out a lot of different messages out there. Do this, this much physical activity for your heart health, this much for your bone health, this much for your muscle health. So we came up with a middle of the road approach for the physical activity guidelines for Americans in recommending 150 minutes a week. But here is one case where that is probably insufficient to preserve bone health with aging. I wanted to pull out one of the prospective cohort studies to show you what some of these data look like. And this is from the, the Nurses Health Study, which I think is probably one of the best large observational studies, in this case, of women. So what you're looking at here on the, uh, on the y-axis is the relative risk of hip fracture and then related to physical activity level per week, quantified in met hours per week. So all they did was take their large cohort of women and they divided them into quintiles by level of physical activity. And you can see this beautiful dose response where the more active you are, the less likely you are to fracture a hip. This study, now this doesn't give us any insight into the type of physical activity they're doing, how frequently they were doing it, what, it, what intensity they were doing it at, or for what duration in a session. <laughs> 
This is just a measure of physical activity volume. But this is one of the few studies that gave us some insight that intensity of exercise may also be an important factor. So here we're looking at relative risk of hip fracture again related to walking speed. So the faster you walk, the higher the intensity of the ground re reaction forces that are generated. So it becomes more bone loading. And that increase in bone loading activity is associated with a greater relative reduction in hip fracture risk. So that's the evidence that we have from these large studies that intensity is important. Now we don't have any large randomized controlled trials that have looked at the role of exercise in reducing actual fracture incidence. But we have many randomized controlled trials and non-randomized controlled trials of exercise with bone mineral density as the outcome. In fact, there have been so many of these small trials that we now have, at my count, 15 meta-analyses of those data, where they pool all the small studies to try to get a better picture of what the net effect of exercise is on BMD. And we get a lot of information from these studies. The first thing is that the benefits are more likely to occur at the spine than the hip. And that's probably because the spine has a high portion of trabecular or spongy type of bone that has a higher turnover rate. So it's more responsive to exercise or other interventions. Um, the majority of the meta-analyses have found uh, that looked at the spine as, a, as a, uh, a regional outcome, the majority of them found benefits. Whereas only five of the 11 meta-analyses that had femoral neck BMD as an outcome found benefits of exercise. Um, these studies tell us that the benefits are apparent in essentially all populations, both pre and post, most postmenopausal women and in men. Um, some of them have looked specifically at endurance exercise as opposed to resistance exercise, and both modes are effective. But the downside of this is that the increases in bone density are really quite small, only in the neighborhood of 1% to 3% when you look at the annualized change. And for the few studies that have had inter interventions that go beyond one year, it's not that this rate of change, this annual rate of change, continues. It seems to plateau at about 1% to 3%, and we really don't see any further increases beyond that. So the magnitude of improvement is small. And even though some of these uh, meta-analyses looked for dose response effects, none of them found significant dose response effects. So that body of evidence was largely what was used to generate the current uh, American College of Sports Medicine position stand on physical activity and bone health. So I was the chair of the writing group that came up with these. We concluded that both weight-bearing endurance activities, activities that involve jumping, and resistance activities are all beneficial for the skeleton. Uh, we concluded that the intensity should be moderate to high in terms of bone loading forces. But for these other two parameters, frequency and duration, it was essentially a guess. We have almost no knowledge about there about how frequently or how long you have to exercise to optimize the benefits of exercise on the skeleton. So these recommendations were based largely on the general exercise recommendations for other health benefits. I see more and more in the papers that I'm reading, especially the review papers, that resistance ex exercise should be more effective for the skeleton than weight-bearing endurance exercise, that you can generate larger forces pulling on bone to bring about beneficial changes in bone metabolism. And these data would support that. These are several hundred people who have come through my lab, ages 20 to 90, men and women, where we're just looking at the relationship between total body bone mineral content and total body fat-free mass or lean mass as a surrogate of muscle mass. And I'm amazed every time I look at this slide because I generated the correlations between these two parameters separately for men and women but you can see that those two lines are almost superimposed on one another. 
suggesting that the relationship between bone and muscle is almost identical in men and women across a very wide age range. Now that would suggest that if you can increase muscle mass, you would increase bone mass. And I'm sure that does occur. But the few studies that have compared resistance exercise head to head with weight bearing endurance exercise suggest that both modes are equally effective. So here's a study that I did many years ago when I was at Washington University in St. Louis, where we took a group of postmenopausal women, previously sedentary, and we put them in a one year exercise training intervention that was very vigorous. And we had them either do what we called relatively high impact exercise, walking, jogging, stair climbing and descending. And some of these, uh, some of these grandmotherly type women got to running a 10K, so they were very uh, uh, motivated. And then the other group was the non-impact group. So there were very few ground reaction forces generated, but they did high intensity weightlifting and rowing. So these are the changes in bone density at a ver variety of skeletal sites that occurred over this one year time interval. And you can see at some of the sites, the improvements in BMD were about 2%, but they were similar with both types of exercise programs. The one skeletal region where there was a difference was the femoral neck. So this is the region where your leg gets connected to your, to your hip, to your hip girdle. And because of the cantilevered nature of that uh, uh, anatomy, anytime I'm in an upright position, that region of my femur is being loaded. But as soon as I sit down, all the weight comes off of that region and is now on the ischial tuberosities. So how do you usually perform resistance exercise? Many of the exercises are performed in a sitting position. So I think this is why we tend to see less benefit, uh, especially at the femoral neck region, in response to weightlifting types of exercises. So that's about our current state of knowledge at the public health level, about the type of exercises that are likely to convert, confer uh, bone health. Let's talk now about some of the established factors that are known to influence the skeleton. And a lot of this is gonna come from preclinical or animal research. Perhaps the best evidence that we have that physical activity is absolutely essential for maintaining good bone health is what happens when we remove physical activity. So this was a study of 17 young men, healthy young men, who underwent four months of bed rest. And so we go from an upright posture to a prone or supine posture, and it's probably not surprising that because most of the forces that come into our, our bodies come in through contact with the ground, that the heel actually had the largest decreases in bone over this four month interval. But as we move up the skeleton to the hip and the spine, those also had significant decreases in bone density just over four months. Now let me put those same data into tabular form now. These changes, three to 4% are huge. Normally in young men, we wouldn't expect them to be losing any bone density. And even if we were studying postmenopausal women who have the steepest rates of decline in BMD, we would expect these rates to only be one to 2% per year. And here we're looking at three to 4% decreases over only four months. So removing physical activity has a rapid and profound effect on bone loss. But if that isn't scary enough, what's even scarier is that they brought these young men back in six months later after they had resumed their normal physical activities and they recovered essentially none of the mineral that they had lost. Now, it's been suggested that it might just take longer to re-accrue any mineral that's lost over a period of time, so maybe they didn't follow them long enough. But I think there's another possible explanation. So this is the hypothesis of court, and it has to do with the fact that bone is a dynamic tissue. We're constantly breaking down old bone, and that's called resorption. That's what this R is. And then we're building new bone. That's called formation. So that's what the F is. So when we're young and healthy, the normal activities that we do on a day-to-day -day basis are sufficient to keep our skeleton in equilibrium. 
where the rate of formation equals the rate of resorption. We're not gaining bone, we're not losing bone. In the bed rest, con or if we wanted to increase BMD, bone mass, we would have to cross some threshold of activity where we engage in high impact or very vigorous exercises so that the rate of formation exceeds the rate of resorption. And then we would actually accrue new bone mineral. And the converse of that is the bed rest condition or the reduced activity condition, where now the loading forces cause a decrease in formation and resorption actually goes up. So if these young men went from this condition to this condition, what would you expect to happen to the skeleton? Come back into equilibrium. So would we expect them to gain much bone or would we just expect them to stop losing bone? I don't know the answer to this question and I don't think it's been addressed in humans. I don't even think it's been addressed very well in animals, but I did find one study using a similar model so this is a study of mice that underwent three weeks of immobilization followed by eight weeks of remobilization. So a, a fairly similar time interval, the four months and six months in uh, the study of men in terms of unloading and reloading. During this period of time, they had a profound, a 25% decrease in trabecular bone volume. And if they just put them back into their cages for what they called free remobilization, all they did was prevent further loss. So these two groups were identical in trabecular bone content. But then they had a low intensity remobilization group. So this was some treadmill exercise and they actually gained back some of the mineral they had lost. And they had a high intensity remobilization group that essentially recovered all of the mineral they had lost. So I think this is at least some evidence for the hypothesis of court. And I think it has pretty profound implications on rehabilitation strategies. Perhaps most importantly for older adults, where if they're sick or injured and have very reduced levels of physical activity for prolonged periods of time, just getting them back to whatever their functional level was before the event may not be enough for maintaining good bone health. So what type of an exercise program is likely to be most effective uh, based on evidence that has come from the animal studies? Well, there's a number of key factors. High magnitude of strain, few repetitions. I'll show you some evidence on that. Uh, the activity has to be dynamic, static exercises, isometric exercises are not effective. High strain rate, so power type activities, not slow movements are more effective. The strain has to be somewhat unique because we adapt to whatever strains are imposed on our skeleton. And we know that the response is specific to the skeletal region that is stressed. We don't get a whole body effect. So if I do bicep curls, it's not going to improve my hip density. So here's some of the data to support these, these factors. This is a study that was conducted in turkeys where they implanted pins in either end of the ulna and then they could put that wing onto a device that either immobilized it or applied compressive forces. And what you're looking at here is an increase in the magnitude of the force that they applied. So this is the, the slide that indicates that increased loading forces cause increases in bone mass. So strain magnitude is important. This is one of my all-time favorite slides because there's so much information packed into this. They took the high intensity uh, loading force program and they carried it out over six weeks in animals that were either immobilized with no force, forces applied. And you can see this 10% decrease in bone mass over only six weeks, or they applied only four loading cycles a day. One, two, three, four. Four high intensity loading cycles is completely sufficient to prevent bone loss in this model. And then it didn't matter if they applied 36 cycles a day or 360 cycles a day, this response was similar. So this is the evidence that with high repetition, her high intensity loading, it only takes a few cycles, maybe somewhere around 36 to maximize the bone adaptation. Now the other important things that come out of this slide is first of all, you see this plateau. 
It doesn't continue to go up because the bone has adapted. And what would you have to do if you wanted to generate further ad adaptations? Overload principle. You'd have to keep increasing the magnitude of the stimulus. Uh, the other thing you notice is that there was no response for the first two weeks. And that's because bone tends to be a, a slow responding tissue. So whereas you might see improvements in muscle uh, much sooner with an intervention, bone studies you typically have to carry out for a longer period of time because it's a bit less responsive. So I've told you that the increases in BMD in response to exercise are small, only about 1 to 3 percent. And those tend to be smaller than the improvements in bone mass that we see with a number of drugs that are currently used to treat osteoporosis or to prevent osteoporosis. And all of those have proven anti-fracture efficacy. So why? Why should we bother to try to prescribe exercise for either the prevention or treatment of osteoporosis when taking a pill is so much easier? Why should we bother? Well, I think there's two reasons why we exercise scientists should continue to do this research and recommend exercise. Let me orient it to this slide because the next three slides are going to be this same format. These are studies conducted in animals where on the left side they have things that we can measure in humans, bone mineral content and bone mineral density. On the right side of the slide, I'm going to show you data that we have trouble collecting in humans because they actually apply enough force to the bone until it fractures. So it's a direct measure of bone strength. I don't get a lot of humans volunteering for those. Um, this slide is showing you the most commonly used drugs to treat osteoporosis, the effect of bisphosphonates. So two bisphosphonates here result in 14 and 15 percent increases in bone mineral content and density. So larger than the effects of loading in general. And they result in roughly proportional, proportional increases in bone strength measured directly. Another drug that's used to treat osteoporosis, severe osteoporosis, is PTH or parathyroid hormone. Here again, larger increases in bone mineral content and density and these result in roughly proportional increases in bone strength. I hope you know where I'm going with this. And now we have loading, mechanical loading. Results in smaller increases in this animal model than drugs on bone mineral content and density, but this small increase in bone mass translates into a huge disproportionate increase in bone strength much larger improvements in bone strength than are seen with pharmacologic therapy. So these preclinical data at least suggest that exercise might actually be more effective than all the drugs we use to prescribe, to, to treat osteoporosis. Exercise might actually be more effective at preventing fractures than those drugs. So we know then based on, or we can suggest that based on these animal data, that physical activity can increase bone mineral density. Even though the magnitude is small, it may have a large impact on bone strength and reduce risk of fracture that way. I said there were two reasons, though, why we should continue to promote exercise. And the other reason is that exercise has extraskeletal effects, that not, not acting through effects on the skeleton. So we know that exercise can improve balance, mobility, muscle strength. You all are doing some outstanding work on that here. Uh, that should translate into a reduction in falls and reduce fractures through that pathway. So that's kind of what we know from largely preclinical evidence on the types of activities that should be likely to uh, benefit the skeleton. Now let's look at some novel factors. These are some that have emerged from preclinical research, again studies of animals that have not yet been tested that I'm aware of in humans. So the concept of having multiple daily sessions rather than a single loading session, the concept of adding rest intervals between sessions or between loading cycles, even taking rest intervals during long-term exercise intervention trials, and then other mediating factors. 
So here's the evidence from animals that multiple sessions per day are likely to be more effective than a single session per day. So in this experiment, they had five different groups of animals, uh, one control group and then four groups that each got 360 loading cycles per day. That was in one single session or broken down into two, four, or six sessions. But total exposure was identical across these four groups. And what you're looking at here is the rate of bone formation that was generated in these, uh, in these groups. So you can see that the exercise with a single session a day was much more effective than non-loading at stimulating bone formation, but yet could be increased almost twofold by breaking those 360 loading cycles into four or six sessions. So we, we, it would at least suggest that having humans do multiple short exercise bouts per day would be more effective than just a single exercise session today, per day. But I don't think we have any evidence to support that yet. The concept of rest, rest intervals is one that's uh, emerging as being very interesting. So this is a paradigm that, that shows you how this is applied at multiple different levels. During a loading session, even interposing rest intervals between loading cycles, so loading the bone, waiting 10 seconds, loading it again, has been found to be more effective than just loading it at one second intervals. Or if you look at the number of loading sessions, this is similar to what I showed you on the previous slide, if you impose a rest interval of several hours, and they've at least suggested that four to eight hours is the minimal window that should be considered, that improves the bone formation response. But even over a 15-week period of exercise training or load training in animals, interposing a rest interval seems to be of benefit. And that's what this slide shows you. Three groups of animals who went through 15 weeks of mechanical loading to look at increases in bone mass or bone strength. The first group had one five-week session of loading and then had a 10-week vacation. The second group had five weeks on, five weeks off, and five weeks back on. And then the third week had loading for the entire 15 weeks. So you can see that the first group that only got five weeks of loading fared less well. They didn't have as much increase in bone strength as the other two groups. But the other two groups, despite having an, a five-week rest interval or not, both increased ultimate force similarly, and actually the group that had uh, a five-week vacation actually fared better in one measure of bone strength. So this suggests that maybe we should program in some, some exercise vacations, not that people need another excuse not to exercise. Now let me talk about uh, some of the potential mediating factors that might either mediate or moderate how bone responds to exercise depending on how, what, how these factors are present. There's a long list, and I could probably put up 10 slides that show potential mediators and moderators. But I want to spend a little bit of time talking about prostaglandin E2. PGE2 is an essential signaling factor in, in bone. So when we apply a mechanical force to bone, it has to generate a biochemical response. And PGE2 is critical for generating that biochemical response. Now, the reason this is important is because PGE2 derives from arachidonic acid under the action of these enzymes, cyclooxygenase. And when you take a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, that drug acts by blocking these enzymes. So that would suggest then that the ability to produce prostaglandins is diminished. And if this is a, an essential signaling factor, it might suggest that if you take NSAIDs, it's going to influence how your bone responds to exercise or loading. And there's actually a fairly broad base of evidence for this from animals. So this is a study where this drug, which is a COX-2 inhibitor, was applied to animals either three hours before, 30 minutes before, or 30 minutes after mechanical loading was applied to bone. And you can see that this is when, when they were treated with a placebo, 
This is the bone formation response that should have occurred, and it was markedly diminished when this non-steroidal anti-inflammatory was given either three hours before or 30 minutes before the loading. But it was not as, as diminished when the drug was given afterwards. So it might suggest that if you have to take NSAIDs, it might be better to take it after exercise than before. So we did what I think is the first and only proof of concept study to look at whether this has any clinical relevance. So we did this exercise intervention, nine months in duration, in a group of healthy young women. On any day that they exercised, they took two study drugs. They took one two hours before their exercise session, and they took one immediately after. So the three drug groups that they were randomized to were ibuprofen before and placebo after, placebo at both time points, or placebo before and ibuprofen after. And this is a standard over-the-counter dose of ibuprofen, 400 milligrams. We hypothesized that it was the group that got ibuprofen before they exercised that it would have the least favorable increases in bone density. And this is the, the changes in BMD that occurred to this group tended to be small decreases, if anything. Now, we thought the group that got placebo at both time points would have about 1% improvements in BMD. They did not. And I won't go into the reasons for that, why I think that occurred right now. But you can see, at least at some sites, they tended to have a more favorable response than the group that got ibuprofen. We thought the group that got ibuprofen after they exercised would be pretty similar to the placebo group. But in fact, this is the group that had really unexpectedly large improvements in bone mineral density. So now we're trying to generate the hypotheses for why that may have occurred. And we think that um, we know that the bone formation signal occurs with just a few loading cycles early in exercise. So we think as long as you don't take ibuprofen or a non anti-inflammatory drug before you exercise, that you'll get a pretty robust bone formation signal. But we think that there are things going on during exercise, especially if it's vigorous, increases in inflammatory cytokines that we know stimulate bone resorption. So we think there's a pretty likely to be a, a pretty robust resorption signal as well. Now, if we give ibuprofen before exercise, based on the animal studies, we would block that formation signal. I don't know how effectively we would block the resorption signal, but this might create a situation where there's an imbalance that favors bone resorption and might actually cause bone loss. In contrast, if you give ibuprofen after exercise, that enables that formation signal to be, to be generated and it might dampen the resorption signal. So now we've got a situation that actually favors formation. So we're in the process of testing these hypotheses to see if it's correct. I also want to spend a few minutes on something that we th I think we thought we knew everything about, that calcium is important for bone. But I want to talk about uh, calcium disruption during exercise and PTH, or parathyroid hormone. And to introduce this, I'm going to talk about bone density of cyclists for a little while. So we know when we compare different groups of athletes, cyclists often appear as having low BMD. In this slide, that's showing it relative to runners. But what is apparent from at least oh, a handful of studies is that cyclists often also seem to have low bone density when you compare them with non-athletes, so lower than normal. And the reason that people often offer for that, for the low BMD in cyclists or, swimming for, or swimmers, for example, is that their low BMD is because they participate in weight-supported activities rather than weight-bearing activities. But I think the fact that BMD levels are below normal in these athletes very often that this may suggest that under certain conditions, exercise may actually be causing a decrease in bone mass. So a couple of years ago, my colleague Dan Barry, who's an internist and a former competitive cyclist, followed a group of uh, road cyclists for one year through a season of training, competition, and then their short off season in Colorado. Uh, 
And you can see that there were decreases in hip bone mineral density over this time, and they're not small changes. The decrease after nine months at the end of their competitive season was one and a half percent. This is the rate of decline that we would expect to see in postmenopausal women who are at high risk for osteoporosis. So we don't think that this is trivial. We have a couple of different hypotheses that we're working on, but this is the one that is, uh, generate, or is, is capturing most of our attention right now. We think that athletes who sweat a lot, and cyclists and swimmers are probably both characterized by the large number of hours that they train per week. So they spend a lot of time sweating. So sweating during exercise is gonna generate calcium loss because there's calcium in sweat. We've estimated that that rate can be as high as 100 milligrams per hour, perhaps even higher. So this is gonna cause a decrease in serum calcium. And serum calcium is something that our bodies defend very, very vigorously, because if your calcium drops very low, that's a really bad thing. So as soon as calcium starts decreasing even a little bit, that sends a signal to our brains to secrete uh, parathyroid hormone. And parathyroid hormone acts on the skeleton to increase bone resorption. So it mobilizes calcium from bone to help defend or stabilize the serum calcium level. And we think possibly that if this happens repeatedly day after day, that this increase in bone resorption could actually cause a decrease in bone mineral density. It might also suggest that if you time when you take your calcium supplement so that it's in your gut ready to be absorbed at a time when you're losing calcium, maybe that would be a strategy that could minimize this effect. So we're doing a number of studies now to try to get some evidence for whether this occurs, these steps in this pathway. Um, here's an interesting observation, just cross-sectional, but from a group of young men who came in and did a two-hour exercise bout where we measured how much calcium they lost, there is this inverse relationship with higher calcium losses being associated with low hip bone mineral density. So interesting, but not definitive evidence for a mechanism here. We've also measured changes in calcium homeostasis during these same types of exercise interventions in the lab. So we do see that there's a decrease in serum ionized calcium from before to after, uh, in this case, one hour of vigorous exercise. We see that this is associated with more than a two-fold increase in PTH. So we think that this will be turning on uh, bone resorption. And then we have a marker of bone resorption, a serum marker called CTX that also increases. So we think we are now generating some definitive evidence that our hypotheses are correct. And we don't think that this happens just in young, healthy male athletes. We've also taken a group of 60 to 75 year old women and had them do one hour of vigorous treadmill walking. They also get this decrease in serum calcium and also get an increase in PTH. So we think that the excessive loss of calcium through sweating during exercise could be a mediator of, of the skeletal adaptations. And whether you're doing weight-supported or weight-bearing exercise, you sweat during both types. So we think that the effect on bone resorption could be similar regardless of the type of exercise, but that because some types of exercise are more effective than others in how they stimulate formation, that it might cause imbalances between formation and resorption, such that with weight-supported exercise, this could result in bone loss, whereas in weight-bearing exercise, it could result in...